welcome to another episode of Management Views. I'm your host, Cindy Bali, and this is my husband and co-host, Jeffrey Tumlin. Yellow. Welcome to the podcast where we try to inspire better work performance. Thanks for listening. Good morning, Management Musers. Today on The Muse, we're going to give you some fun stories from our conversation with Jefferson B. Cowell. If you haven't already done so, we have three other episodes with Jefferson B. Cowell. They are focused on three stories about crisis management. This episode is different. These are just uh, fun stories from an interesting life. Enjoy. I hear Tom Cruise came oh, to yeah. d- dinner, visit, something. I was a brand new center director by about two months. <laughs> and I get a call from Washington. And they're saying, you know, and I don't know if it was Sean himself or one of his assistants telling me that, hey, Sean, Tom Cruise is coming to visit the Johnson Space Center, and O'Keefe's going to come down and meet him and, and spend some time with him, and as well as some other heavies from up headquarters. And he liked to, he has asked, you know, <clears throat> he had done a couple of movies, HD movies in support of NASA, the International Space Station, and all that. And so the quid pro quo is, you know, what are you going to do for me? He said, I'd like to go train with the astronauts and do some astronaut training. And they said, okay, we can work that out. And so wow. that happens at the Johnson Space Center. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so he he comes in with his entourage. He has an assistant. Uh, he's in a big RV. Looks like, you know, Willie Nelson or something, you know. But it's just very private. And it's just Tom Cruise and his assistant in this thing, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, he come, and and all the heavy like come a big down. bus, huh? He it's rolls in in a big bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't see any of this. Right, he's, yeah. he's parked you know, somewhere out wow. there, but comes in automobiles under escort and all that kind of stuff. And so, O'Keefe's there initially to meet with him, and there's a glad handing and talk about here's what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, and. And he and he says, you know, I'd like to finalize come in training with astronauts. He said, I know I can't be an astronaut, but I'd like to train with them. And Sean said, well, what are you going to do for us on top of that? And he, <clears throat> he said, well, I'm glad you asked because, uh, you know, I, I set up a website for every new movie I'm going to make a year ahead of it yep. being released where we advertise and, and we come up uh, on the net and uh, – and, uh, publicize what we're going to do and he said i've looked at the nasa website and my website experts call it three clicks to oblivion wow. <laughs> he said your website is just totally screwed up and he said nasa you got all this great stuff, yeah 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 sexy you put people stuff up there, yeah, 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 yeah. So you're doing all this wonderful stuff it's terrible and nobody website. knows yeah, about right. it yeah 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 so he said my guy will show you how to change that that's wow. awesome and so they came in there yeah. and helped out the cruise comes in. Sean goes back to Washington, and uh, Cruz is down there for several days. Or I just I don't bother with him, but he's with the astronauts yep, sure in the understand. astronaut office and training in the tank with him and doing other stuff with him. And uh, and I realize in his second or third day, I, I, his assistant comes by to check in. Uh, you know how are things going? Well, you know yada yada. I said. Is uh, Mr. Cruz, I said, is he socializing? He's doing anything? Well, no, he said, we have this van. He goes there and he, he's studying. He's getting ready for the last uh, Samurai movie and he's growing a beard. Oh, yeah. So he could be sort of, you know, yeah. secretive, I guess, have a, a guise yeah. to hide him. But he said, uh, he sort of staying to himself. I said, well, gee whiz, I'd like to have him over for dinner. And, uh, you know, and we like to just invite, say, why don't we invite some astronauts to come and him come, and they can just break bread together and socialize and get to know each other better. He said, I, he said that's a great idea, and I'll, I'll see if Mr. Cruz would like to do that. And call back an hour or so, I said, yes, he'd, he'd love to come. And so I gave him my address. There we just lived 15 minutes from JSC on El Dorado Street in, yep. in and I and I called Janelle. I said, "Guess who's coming to dinner?" Too you know? funny. And, yeah. 
she after doing a couple of black backflips. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. And, and uh, he named off several vintage wow. aircraft that he owns. Wow. He said he'd actually flown in the Reno Air Races in his P fifty one, and uh, so I just. It's funny. I think he got mad at me because I just told him. I said, "I said, Tom, I said, I, I, I said, you got three kids, and you're out there risking your neck. I said, you need to be more careful and think about them, yeah. and not you know risk your neck." Yeah. And uh, he said, "Well, I'll think about that." And but he he just was a friendly, nice guy, yeah. and I was much older than him, and yeah. and we had a great chat and yeah. talked. He he wanted to know about you know fighter aviation and flying and all that kind of stuff. So we ch talked about I talked about the F-4. Yeah. Even though I'd flown the F-18 also, but I, all, most of my flying was done in the Phantom. And yeah. he was very interested in that. So yeah. he was just a nice guy, yeah. and he left. He had to leave. Janelle was leaving the next day. She had to go to a meeting of retired general officers' wives up in D.C., and while she's up in Washington, she gets a big bouquet of flowers from Tom Cruise. Wow. Oh, Thank that's you very so much for dinner, awesome. you know. And yeah. so, so that was that was a big deal. Yeah, of course. Of course, my daughter, who was in Austin at the time, really got upset that I didn't invite I'm her sure. to, yeah. to dinner with Tom Cruise. But uh, yeah. that was that yeah. was it was a nice time thing, mm -hmm. nice event. Yeah, that is nice. I'm sure he doesn't remember it at all, but it was. Well, you got a picture. Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, dinner with astronauts. Yeah, I you never might know. remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he was with us another day or two, and then he went away, and to my knowledge, never came back. But uh, nice fellow. And tell us, tell us the story about when you found out that you made general. Oh. Well, I was yeah. I, took, I was the deputy commander of Marine Forces Pacific, two-star general. My boss. No, no. When you found out you were going from colonel, oh, colonel to one-star. Oh, I'd been passed over for promotion twice. So you figure that's it? No I was, way. I was going on. I was, I'm going out as a colonel. Yeah, and I'm going out as a colonel, and I'd accepted that. And you you made peace with that? I yes, and I I. I I didn't like it, but sure. uh, but yeah. it's just the way it was, and yeah. I wasn't going to grieve over it. And so I, I felt like you know I'd let my family down, and I didn't make the, the cut. But <clears throat> I'd been called by a couple of guys who had been on that board, and they told me they thought I got a raw deal, and they weren't supposed to tell me that. But uh, so it was sort of you understood that uh, you were a player, but you just didn't make the cut. But so I'm, I'm, Janelle and I are going to retire, and I'm going to go back to Texas when we retire from the Marines. But our son was a senior at the University of Richmond in, in Richmond, Virginia, on a soccer ride. He was on the soccer team at Richmond Spiders. And so we still had an opportunity to drive down on the weekends and sometimes weeknights and go see him play soccer there at Richmond. And so I decided... I had a very a very good job in the Pentagon with the Navy. I was a liaison with the Oppo 5 Air Warfare and a senior Marine liaison officer with them in uh, aviation. And uh, I thought I was helping. And so uh, I was, that was what I was doing. I was in the Pentagon in the, the D-ring there. And uh, <clears throat> one afternoon it's in the fall, uh, the the general's boards are meeting again. I I you giving up I was, on I that. was aware of yeah. it, but that was not I wasn't a player, and right. so I realized you know twice is all you know you're going to get as a look, and so uh, Janelle I, had called me uh, about her son Richmond was playing. Uh, she picked me up in her car and and uh, we went to the game. Yeah, and so uh, she brings me back. I got to finish where you know it's still it's about almost five o'clock. Everybody. The regulars are all going home. That's when the Marines stay and work another hour. You know? That's, that's, <laughs> that's what right. Marines do. The Air Force has gone long gone before oh, yeah, but long gone. But we're, yeah. you know, we're still trying to get every cent out of the Navy we can. That's when we get a lot of it right, right, right. behind the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm I'm walking back up to my office in the D-ring. I was butted up against Admiral Gilchrist, was the head of aviation programs for Oppo 5. Great guy. And so I'm, I'm walking up there, and I, as I approach my office, there are a bunch of people 
standing by the door. Of your office? Of my office. And they said, Pete, where the hell have you been? The commandant of the Marine Corps has been calling you. And they want, they want you to call him back. I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what this is all about. And so I, <laughs> I called over there. He'd already left town to go. He was on a trip. Huh? So I, I talked to the assistant commandant, uh, General Went, huh? four star, and he, he told me, said, said Beek, said, I, I just want to let you know that on behalf of the commandant, I'm happy to say that you have been selected for brigadier general. Wow. And I said, uh, well, I said, that's quite a surprise. He said, well, congratulations, you deserve it, and we're really happy. Wow. And so uh, so I became a brigadier general after that. Didn't see it coming. Say again? You didn't see it coming. No. I had gotten, you know, you, every time the board met, there were rumors. Yeah. And rumors of rumors. But uh, three times, you, you know, after being passed over twice, that just doesn't happen. Mm. Except every once in a while. <laughs> Hello, management users. Today, I want to tell you about my favorite product, the Comprehensive Organizational Benchmark Report and Analysis. That's right, we call it COBRA. And if you want that bad boy to strike at the debilitating uncertainty, that fuzzy estimates and half-baked guesses due to your company, and better understand the social and cultural dimensions of your organization, then give us a call or email us at C-U-L-S-U-R-E dot com. That's C-U-L-S-U-R-E dot com. All right, we're going climbing in the way back machine to Beak as an infantryman. And that's one thing in the coincidence department. When he was a three-star Marine for Pacific, I was a humble lieutenant in Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. And so he... Even though I was Army and he was Marine, it would have basically been that he was like my boss's 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 boss. <laughs> so we didn't cross in orbit, but we were in Hawaii at the same time. Yeah. And so this goes all this story goes all the way back to uh, Beek's early career. He started as an infantry officer before uh, yeah. becoming a Marine aviator. And so tell us about what you learned in the story as an infantryman okay. with the incident with the Lance Corporal? It had a profound effect on me. Uh, to this day, <clears throat> I learned a great lesson. I was a platoon leader at Camp Pendleton, California. We were at Camp Los Pulgas. I was in the uh, 7th Marines. And uh, we were training as a battalion, a 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, to go over to Westpac to Okinawa, for a year deployment, they call it. Uh, the I'm not. I can't remember what they would call it. Transplant. Yeah, well, it was something like that. Transplacement. Transplacement. They called it transplacement okay. organizations, where you would go over for a year, and uh, and then come back. And, oh. and so that's what we did. And at this time, I'm a recent graduate of the basic school. There in Quantico, Virginia. Yeah, brand new. Second, second lieutenant Howell, uh, yeah, infantry platoon <laughs> leader, and uh, yeah, a year out of college. And uh, so we're. Yeah. It had been a tough beginning because of the Cuban Missile Crisis had occurred right before my battalion was organized. We actually, when I was home on leave on the way out there, when that all occurred, and so when I got out there, most of the Marine division that I was supposed to be a part of was gone. And they were circling Cuba, getting ready to invade Cuba. Wow. And which did not happen. Right. But uh, but so when we tried to organize our battalion, we were lacking personnel. A lot of, they'd taken everybody they needed for combat. You know, that's what the Marine Corps does. And uh, thinking they were gonna fight in Cuba, even though it didn't happen. And so uh, we put together a battalion had a lot of misfits and uh, and, and uh, brigarettes, and uh, it was uh, there were a lot of challenges for mm. a young leader mm. to motivate your troops. I had several privates in my platoon who had already been overseas and back, and wow. they were still privates. Wow! And uh, wow, and for good reason. Yes, they <laughs> as well deserved. Yeah, <laughs> page twelve in in your record book where it has your record of. Offenses and yeah, discipline, and, uh, disciplinary short, and they had several pages. Some of these guys. well deserved. 
Yeah. So, uh, so it was. Uh, but I thought I was getting it done. I would, you know, I'm motivating, and uh, and we worked uh, six days a week. Work mm -hmm. all, you know, Saturdays also. We get Sundays off. But uh, by this time, I think it was either Thanksgiving or sometime close to that in November. <clears throat> we get a three day weekend. I'm pretty sure it was for Thanksgiving. And so we actually had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. And uh, well, after you were dismissed on Friday at noon. And so I I was living in a little community outside of Cap Pendleton there with uh, three other lieutenant idiots. <laughs> and uh, we decided, yeah. hey, let's use this long weekend. Let's go up to L.A. A guy. Sure. We had a guy who was a, had an uncle who was a bachelor who he thought could help us find some dates and we sure. could have some fun in Los Angeles. And so uh, we decided that Friday night we would get ready for the next week's activities and put our lesson plans together, shine your boots, do all that stuff, you know, to get ready. And we bought a, had a case of beer to sure. consume uh, while we were doing all that. Sure. And, of course, that gets done more before we do anything. Yeah. And so uh, right about almost noontime, uh, or noontime, almost midnight, uh, I get a, we get a call. It's the the uh, regimental duty officer, so Marines, looking for Lieutenant Howell. Uh-oh. And he said, uh, you got a, you have a Lieutenant Schmuckatelli, whatever, whatever his name was. Yeah. And I said, yes, sir, he's one of mine. He's a Lance Corporal. And he said, well... He's in the lockup brig in San Diego at the harbor at the at the Navy lockup. He said he got arrested in Tijuana by shore patrol, and your lucky shore patrol got him before the Mexican police because he was uh, he's in a lot of trouble for disorderly conduct and doing some bad things. And so they got him in the lockup, and so he's going to spend the weekend there. Or you can go down and get him, Lieutenant. What are you going to do? I said, well, I'll go get him. All right. And he said, okay. And so I turned to my buddy, Tom Campbell, who we go to college together at the University of Texas. He's a lieutenant also. I get him to drive down to San Diego with me that night to go get this guy. Yeah, midnight. Yeah. And this is in this is in my 61 Corvette. Wow. Uh, which I uh, how you know Campbell and me and how this third party in the back get in that back. There, was, there was no back. There were no three back. idiotic yeah, Marines. But we were going to do this. We were going to do this. These <laughs> three idiotic wise Marines. decisions. Yeah, right. And so uh, at that time there were no interstates. It shows you, you know, people yeah. don't understand. Wow. It was just uh, Highway 101, the uh, yeah. Pacific the, Coast, El Camino Real, oh, yeah. and. Uh, and going down to uh, to San Diego and all the lights, traffic lights and what yeah, have you. Sure. But it was late in the evening, and so got down there in, in less than an hour and uh, find the Navy lockup. It's just like a uh, police yeah. uh, cell block, you know, kind of a yeah. uh, house. And and uh, you go in there, and there's the the sort of the people coming and going, uh, people under arrest uh, in handcuffs and and a lot of drunks and all that kind of stuff. And you have the smell uh, that comes with a lot of drunks doing bad things. And uh, and so we walk in there, and I'm in civvies. And still, you know, I haven't had anything to drink for a while, but still probably half in the bag sure. in some ways. Sure. But so I find up on against the wall, up on a uh, podium with a desk, it's this huge man, big burly, monstrous, Chief Petty Officer, okay, and he with a huge body, little head, and he's a, and he looks mean as hell, and he's the Chief Petty Officer in charge of the precinct, okay, and uh, and I walk up to him, and who are you? And I show him my ID. I'm Second Lieutenant Owl, and I've come to get Schmuckatelli and take him home. Schmuckatelli, who's that? And he turns to one of his petty officer who's standing by his side in his white smock and MP thing on and so they look of course there's no computers back right. then so yeah. you got a clipboard with paper on it you know and a stubby pencil attached to a string attached to this thing and they're looking at Schmuck oh here he is chief and shows Schmuck he reads it Lieutenant you can't have him 
not after what he did. We we're going to send him up in a paddy wagon. Uh, wow. And he said, because he, some of the stuff he pulled. And so uh, you can't have him. And I'm, you know, I've come all this way. Wow. I'm very upset. Yeah, I don't like this guy. And so I just say, okay, I'd like to see him. Is it possible for me to go see him? And he gives, you know, one of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, okay, okay. He said, take him back and show him Schmuckatelli. And so I go back in the cell block with him, and Campbell's with me parading along, and and it clang, clang, going through you know, cellways and doors and all that. Mm-hmm. And finally, there he is. They got him in a cell by himself, sitting on a bunk on a cot, head down. He's already got blood, traces of blood on his head, and and one eye sort of closed, and he sort of looks pretty awful. And, uh, of course, he's, he'd been drinking, and uh, God only knows what uh, how they— they worked him over once they arrested him, but uh, he he was subdued. And so I, <clears throat> I tell him, I said, I've come to get you, but they won't let me have you. But I just want to let you know I was here, and uh, is there anything I can do for you before I go back up to Pendleton? And he, and he said, uh, he sort of mumbled out, well, sort of hungry and no smokes, and uh, you know, back then everybody smoked. And, and so... Uh, Campbell goes to get some crackers out of a machine for him to feed him, and uh, and they find him a cigarette. And so we're all we're waiting for Campbell to come back. I'm sitting there talking to him, and I'm trying to get him to tell me what happened or what he remembers. And I can't get him to talk. He won't say anything. He just he's down. He won't even look at me. He just heads hanging down, and he uh, feels awful. And and I finally tell him. I see. I said, you know, this whole incident really surprises me because you've been one of my better Marines in this platoon. And as a matter of fact, I promoted you to Lance Corporal last month. Is that correct? And he said, yes, sir. And I said, so yeah, I said, you always have a clean rifle and uh, you've been doing great things. And so I'm surprised this occurred. Is there any way you could tell me, you know, what happened? Why, why, why did you do what you did? And it's right at that moment he sort of sits up erect and looks me, stares me right in the eye, just looks me right in the eye. He said, well, you know, Lieutenant, we've been in that platoon together for uh, over three months, and you inspect my rifle, you instruct me, you look after us, but he said, you've never asked me about my personal life or my family or my girlfriend or anything. So he said, I just got the feeling you didn't care, and, and you and the platoon sergeant don't care about me. And he said, it just got to me. And I just let it go to my head and I blew up. And I, and, and it was like he stuck a knife right in my heart because he was right. He was right. Hmm. I had stereotyped him as an okay Marine. He wasn't one of my best ones. Those are the guys you like to be around with or rub shoulders with. He wasn't one of my worst ones who I spent all most of my time corralling and trying to keep on the straight and narrow and motivate and what have you. And and he had just been there and had, had gotten along. And and I had uh, ignored him. And mm-hmm. uh, and that was one of the worst things a leader could ever do. And I so I had failed him as a leader. And I pledged at that time I will never be that way again. I'll treat everybody individually with respect and give them the attention mm. and respect they deserve. And I, I pledged to do that. And I hope I, as a rule, I did that mm. for the rest of my time I was in the Marine Corps. But that was quite a a very profound lesson for yeah. me. Yeah. In, in I leadership. think that's a good management lesson too, in general. I mean, well, for any leader, you know, I mean, the people who are doing a, a good job. They're not the people you spend your time with because no, you're. No, but they need their strokes. Right. right. They need some uh, attention. They need a uh, pat on the back, and so I've tried my best to follow through on that since then. And but you're absolutely right. Yeah, that salt, that kind of salt of the earth category, where not the not the water walkers, not the problem children, and. Right, they're just not really getting the recognition, sure. and they're not getting your time, and so it's communicating that they actually have less value than even your problematic people. Yeah. yeah. Hello, musers. Now it's time for commercial break. 
Today I'm going to tell you a little something about our strategic planning products. Did you know most companies don't have a strategy and most strategic plans aren't strategic? And that just doesn't sound right to us. We'll help you convene your core leadership team and shape a strategy and a strategic plan that's just right for your organization. We offer six, nine, and 12 session packages led by facilitators with doctorates in management or related fields who also have decades of experience in business. We'll help you leverage your core competencies and your unique insights into a competitive advantage. Contact us at ondemandleadership.com. We're looking forward to hearing from you. I was thinking is because I know how your trajectory in the Marine Corps ends. It ends with over 80,000 people. And so I know that this lesson you learned was about trying to be present with every single person. How do you do that when there's 80,000? And so what what's the poco leadership? A, poco a poco, little by little. The, okay. Uh, you have to think big and, and okay. make decisions for the whole organization and to guide and direct at the same time anytime you have the opportunity to be around groups of marines or sailors or whoever you're commanding or leading devote some time to them pay a little particular time with them i'll never forget on an elevator at the johnson space center going up with a, a lady who i don't think i'd ever seen before but she looked dejected and i just turned to her, i said so you really look like you're upset about something. Is anything that's troubling you? Is anything I can do for you? And she just opened up and then later wrote me this long letter about how much she appreciated that. I was the first mm-hmm. leader at the Johnson Space Center who'd ever asked her about you know yeah. her situation. And so that really means a lot to people. Yeah, just looking after them and and, and being concerned about their welfare. Oh. so it's it's important. Yeah, yeah, you got to. You got to take care of the organization. You got to get the job done. That was yeah. always mission. Always has to be completed. Yeah, and that that's paramount. Well, yeah. at the same time, look after your people. Take care of them. Yeah. Uh, try to help them. Help them do wonderful things. Is the way I like to put it. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. yeah. Good reminder. Lunch with the King of Jordan. Oh. Tell us about lunch with the King of Jordan. Okay, this is thirty years later. Yeah, yeah. This is three Long star. Behold, Hal, Lieutenant Hal has all yep. of a sudden been a, become a general, and now all of a sudden he's a three star general in charge of Marine Forces Pacific. And I told you about all these hats I wore. I was, you know, commander of Marine Bases Pacific. I was a commander of Fleet Marine Forces Pacific. I was also the commander, uh, the component commander under the commander in chief Korea and the United <laughs> Nations Forces Korea. <laughs> But I was also yeah. the component commander, Marine Jack commander, under Sink Sent, Central Command, wow. Commander-in-Chief. And wow. so I was in command of all the Marine forces in the Persian Gulf. And this was a, between wars. This was, none of that was going on. And my, you know, so we were planning. We had to do all the war planning, go to commander's meetings in Florida with Central Command and all that stuff. And, uh, and I was one of his component commanders. And so uh, a guy named John Mayer, who I really, to this day, I respect and appreciate, was one of them, was my op, my G3, uh, he told me, he said... Some Marine? Yeah, he's Marine. Mm. Uh, he was the head of my operations at Marine Forces Pacific. And he, he encouraged me to go for a command visit to the Persian Gulf. He said, we need to get over there. Your presence needs to be known among the, you know, the Saudis and the gutters and... And all those people, and so they know who you are, and uh, and so uh, I was on a command trip to the Persian Gulf, and uh, I think it's the name of the port is Akabar. Is that at the at the tip of Jordan there, where it meets the Persian Gulf? Is uh, we have flown into there because there was a uh, Marine ship, uh, a. Uh, I think it was the Boxer. It was a you know a, a Marine troop carrier that had landing ships and helicopters on it, and they were in the port at that time. And I found out they were training with the Jordanian forces in the Jordanian desert up there. And so I decided to go visit them. So we landed at Akabar and and we drive up with an entourage 
up uh, to, well, yeah, and we visited their training. The Marine got briefed, of course, I'm the big shot. So the uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit commander is a colonel, briefs me on what they're doing, the training they're doing. And so I end up in uh, the capital of Jordan. Tell me what that is. Amman? Yeah, Amman, yeah. Jordan. And the next day I fly in there visiting with the chief of staff of the Jordanian Armed Forces. And we have a nice visit. And uh, during that visit, he asked me through uh, interpreters, you know, translators, uh, our, our king, his royal majesty, is, has a request from you. I said, of course, whatever. He said, uh, he wondered if you would like to come out and have lunch with him today. I said, no, I'd be delighted. Wow. He said, well, he's out in the desert watching the training. Wow. So we'll fly you out there and you'll have lunch out in the desert together. Wow. And, uh, and so I, I get on an airplane at Jordan. I meet the, the present president of Jordan is the head of the Air Force at the time, his son, his oldest son. Yeah. And I meet him at the airport. He puts me on a helicopter, Jordanian helicopter, and we fly out to the desert. And it's, 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 this is where uh, Lawrence of Arabia yeah. did his operations. In yeah. Arabia. It's just an incredible area out there. And I'd been out there you know, two nights prior visiting the Marines. I hadn't had anything to do with the Jordanians. And all of a sudden, up on a bluff overlooking this expanse where there's troop maneuvering is a series of big Arabian tents. Mm -hmm. And in one of them is the King Hussein sitting up there watching wow. them train. And they're, and so they take me, fly me to a bluff next to it. And then they drive me over to this one. And I go in and he gets up and shakes my hand and makes me, I salute him and do all that good stuff and asks me to sit with him. And uh, we watched the training and he said, uh, would you like to, you, would you like to have lunch with me? Uh, he said, we're going to go down to one of my camps and have lunch. I said, I'd be delighted. He said, well, your people will f follow me. And so they put me in a Marine Hummer behind him and a Range Rover and he, he's driving and he just takes off across the desert <laughs> like a bat out of hell. And we're trying to keep up with him, and uh, it, it, uh, he's way out of sight, and we're just following his trail. And finally, we come come over a bluff. It's just like the movies. Here's this fort. Looks like an old French Foreign Legion fort, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's got a parade ground and all that stuff. And he's driven in there, and they had a formation waiting for him. And by the time I arrive, we're shunted to one side of this area, this where this formation's going on and all the different officers in this whatever it is, brigade or whatever it is, are coming up and kissing his ring and asking for favors and what have you, you know, and he's talking to all of them. And that's that's what's going on. And so our escort, a fellow who's been assigned to escort me, takes said, Let me take you where we're gonna meet for lunch. And so he takes me to this huge tent. It's got a carpet underneath it, and all in. He's got this huge room, nothing in there, except it's got two little chairs and a table, but smaller than that desk sitting between them. And he said that this is where he will meet you. And so, so we're standing around in this huge tent there, and all of a sudden he arrives with this entourage, and comes over and says, "Oh, I'm glad you're here." And shakes my hand again. Come sit down and join me. And we, we sit down on these two seats. We're the only ones sitting, okay? Have this big throng of people, both Jordanian and United States, you know, standing there watching us. And this rusty old guy in, in Arabian robes. And, I mean, he looks like he's about 200 years old. Got a saber in his belt, you know. He comes out with a pitcher with two cups. And it's got tea in it. And he pours one cup, and then he drinks it himself, shows it to the king that he's drank. You know, it's not poison. And the king nods at him, and so he pours him a cup of tea, and then he pours me a cup of tea. So we're sitting there chatting about what's going on, and 
he's thanking me for we've loaned him a bunch of ammunition to use in his training 105 stuff the marines are doing away with 105 and uh and so it was <clears throat> it was very convenient and uh, so yeah. we had we had given him a whole bunch of he was very very pleased with that and thankful and we chatted about that and uh, other things and and so he, he finally he, he he empties his and asks for more he gives him more so i get more and we sip and then uh he gives it to the guy and the guy walks off and so everybody just stand there watching us we're the only one drinking tea and he said he said oh he said we're having lunch in one of the buildings so he said come join me there okay i said yes sir we'll do thank you and so he marches off with his entourage and we follow into a big dining room yeah. that's got one big table in the middle with at least two if not three huge piles of probably lamb yeah and yeah. mutton and 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 yogurt yeah. poured on it and that kind of stuff and with raisins and all that stuff yeah. around and I see him standing there and of course they just use their right hand they don't use their left hand for any food it's a hands behind your back sort of like thing and you you I'm watching him. He gulped all that together and, and starts and eating it and offers it to me. So I glob and eat, and we're there talking, yeah. and he's working the room. He's got yeah, a lot of people yeah, he wants sure. to talk to, but I'm there. And uh, about a half an hour later or so, he comes by. He said, I must go. I have to go back. But uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your coming to see me and visiting with us. And, and I, of course, thank him very much. And he gets in a helicopter, flies it, he's a pilot, and wow. flies it away. Wow. Yeah. And so I... It's good to be they, the king. They get me in a helicopter and fly me back down to Aqaba to the, yeah. where the boxer is. Yeah. But uh, that was a that was an incredible experience. I bet. Totally unexpected. I had never planned on meeting yeah. the king of Jordan. Ah, I can see why. Yeah, totally impromptu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're having lunch that day with the king <laughs> right then. Yeah. Yeah, and he... Uh, yeah. He died about three or four years after that. You know, he had mm. leukemia or something, some cancer. Mm. And uh, really a nice, gracious man. Very, mm. of course, very fluent in English. He had an had a American wife huh. and one of his wives, I'm sure. But uh, that was that was a bolt out of the blue and, and just a yeah. unique, wonderful experience. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to learn more about the topic, check out our show notes. And if you want to help us out, like, share, subscribe, and five stars are all deeply appreciated. See you next time on The Management Muse. 